The cross is a dimension in God that avails to us possibilities of intervention. The reason it became necessary that man receives intervention from God is because man engaged in treason and he lost his rulership and dominion over the visible realm. The systems of this world were under the government of God as stewarded by mortals or the man that God put in the garden. But he did not understand the significance of the office he occupied as the administrator of the purposes of God. He assumed that his stay in the garden was a place of relaxation because there were fruits and he lived the life of perpetual luxury. But what he did not understand was a heavier work and responsibility in the garden was the job of priesthood and rulership. When God said, dress the garden and keep it, God actually told him, conduct acts of priesthood and rulership. In priesthood, he was supposed to keep the earth perpetually connected to heaven so that the earth can stream the realities of Zion. That which is obtainable in the heavens was supposed to be obtainable in the earth realm on account of the efficacy and potency of his priesthood. Rulership, on the other hand, was an administrative position granted man to be able to extend the frontiers of Eden to swallow up the earth that was already corrupt and vulnerable to the dictates and government of the devil. So man had two assignments. Keep the earth plugged to heaven and keep the eventual earth to dominate the previous earth so that the will of God can be expressed on earth as it is in heaven. It had nothing to do with pleasure. It had everything to do with priesthood and rulership. But he did not understand that he was involved in a game of spirits. He was not informed enough that he was participating in a warfare of thrones. That governments and dominions were at war. And he was at the center of the expression of the will and purposes of the spirit that marshaled the affairs of those governments. He did not understand that his assignment in the garden was an assignment that would reflect the purpose of God if it will ever find expression on earth. And by reason of that, he became the most strategic creature that God had ever made. Because why the angels dwell in the realm of God where there is perfect order and decorum, where there is no need to further creation because it was perfect, man was in a realm where Eden needed to continually evolve and dominate the earth. So man was God's most strategic creature at the time. But he had no understanding. He thought existence was about pleasure. And when the devil came to offer him something that looked more robust than what he had, the, the possibilities of pleasure were activated on his inside. And he thought he wanted to be wise. And he took the path of treason. And on account of that departure from the government of God, he lost rulership over the earth. And to make things worse, God showed up and said, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. So he was separated from his vital connections to the regions of the Shamayim. He no longer had connection to the heavens. So priesthood and rulership was cut off and the man became a slave of the devil. So God said, you are dust. And the problem with being the dust is that the serpent feeds on dust. So the man became the slave of the devil. The only way by which God could restore man back to that hallowed position of priesthood and rulership was for the fact that, you know, the fall of man was not necessarily about the devil. It was about government. It was about constitutions. It was about legislation. It was about rulership. So when man fell, his greatest problem was not the devil. His greatest problem was actually God because he could no longer fraternize with God. And the one that will ensure that the justice system of the universe is kept is not the devil. God is the one that watches over the justice system of the realm. So when he fell, it was not the devil that would carry out or to enact the laws that were required for restitution to be achieved. It was God himself. And that was why God was the one that drove him out of the garden, not the devil. Because God is the just custodian of justice, judgment, and equity. So God drove him from the garden. 
So his greatest challenge was to be restored back to God. And the only way God could achieve that. Meanwhile, the reason God drove him away was an act of love. Because if he ate of the tree of life, he would have been perpetually damned like the devil. The reason the devil cannot be saved is because the devil, the totality of his constitution is eternal. But man is not eternal. Man is spirit, soul and body. So there's a dimension of man that fragments his reality into time. And because of that fragmentation of his reality, there's a possibility of intervention. On a, for the devil, there could not be any intervention for the devil. Because he's all spirit. So when the devil fell, he fell forever. So the reason God drove the man from the garden is so that he doesn't eat the tree of life and become immortally corrupt. That was why God expelled him from the garden. Because if he ate the tree of life, there is nothing God would have been able to do about it. So God quickly sent a cherub and escorted the man out of the garden so that he will save him. So that pursuit of man from the garden was actually an intervention orchestrated from the love of God. And when God expelled man from the garden, you know, the Elohim sat in himself before the beginning of time. <laughs> you know, you need, sometimes when you want to build, you have to clear the glasses. I'm shifting the debris so we can... Before existence, existence existed. Elohim sat in himself, you know. God, you can't, you can't contemplate God. So stop. Just worship Him. <laughs> Where was He standing before He created space? Okay, journey from space into eternity. Where was He when He created the spirit realm? That means God is beyond spirit. But what God wants you to understand, the one you can understand is what He told you, that God is spirit. <laughs> you know, when you want to talk to a child, you will talk to the child at the level he understands. So when you read the Bible, don't be proud and say, we know God, we know God. No, everything written in the Bible is what we can understand. There is much more that we can't understand. So there's no need to write it. Have you read the book of John chapter 21? He said, these ones are written that you may believe. But many things did Christ that were not written. Because if they were to be written, you see all the volume of books in this world can't contain it. That was three and a half years. What Jesus did in three and a half years, all the books in the world can't contain it. So, if you want to write about God that existed before time, where will you write it? So, the one he wrote is the one you can understand. God is beyond spirit. <laughs> but you can understand spirit, so he, he explained that one to you. But before God ever created the spirit realm, he sat in himself. How do you sit in yourself? <laughs> There are many things that English language can't capture. But let's manage with body. <laughs> Have you had an encounter before you woke up? You can't explain it. Your mind battles with it for a long time. Then you relax. Whatever this encounter want to make me, let it make me. For it's not to be explained. <laughs> That's why if a man meets God, he becomes humble. When you see a proud person, he has not seen God. Everything he's telling you, he read it. If you have seen God, you'll be humble. Because you... Man is weak. Elohim sat in himself. And Abba communed with Ruach. And Ruach communed with the Logos. And the Logos commune with Abba. It was like a cycle, unending reality. God was flowing from Father to Spirit. And Spirit was flowing to the world. And the world was flowing to the Father. It was like a conversation, but it was beyond conversation. It was the mystery of oneness. The technology of oneness was activated again. And so the Father flowed into the Spirit. And the Spirit flowed into the Father. And the world flowed into the Father. And the communion... Co you know, sometimes when you have an encounter and God wants to show you mysteries. Some people have traveled that far. You will appear in the spirit. And then you will see people sitting in cycles. Spirit will sit in cycles. And then they will bring you into that cycle. You will enter that cycle in a second and step out. When you come out, 
what will be downloaded into you, you can't explain it in a lifetime. Because there's a realm where they don't talk. There's a realm where we flow. So realities flow like a river. It just keeps flowing. That's what happened between the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And as it continued to flow, he flowed. That was how he created man. So when he said in Genesis 1.26, let us make man, it was not cognitive terms. They wanted to show Moses what happened. So they, they were trying to give Moses understanding. So when he said, let us make man, it was actually the Father, the Son, and the Spirit talking at the same time. So the communion hit a crescendo. So Father, Spirit, Son became one. So as the Father was saying, let us, the Son is saying, let us, the Spirit is saying, let us make man. So it was actually a betting process. So God vomited man from his spirit. That was what happened. And that was how creation took place. And again, man had fallen. So God went back to that same place. That place where he stood before he decided to make man. He went back there. And then he wanted to restore man back to the original template that he designed. Because on account of the fall, man had lost the template. Man had entertained corruption into his boundaries. It became impossible for the man to become a reflection of God. So the only thing God could do, because there are many places in God. You can visit some places in God and all you will see is fire. So you will come back and say, God is a consuming fire. You are correct. But that's not all God. You can visit another place in God and you will see light. And you will say, God is light. You can visit another place in God, you will find love. So there are different places in God. There was a place where God stood before he created. He journeyed back there and communed again. And it was on the strength of that communion that God decided to bet the technology of salvation. And everything about salvation rested on something called the cross. So I said the cross is not a wound. The cross is a dimension in God that makes available salvation. The cross is a dimension in God where intervention and restoration is possible. And when God trafficked back into that place where salvation in him was possible, he decided to bring that technology into the world. And the first thing that technology achieved from us, for us, was coin, what was relationship. That relationship that was separated in Eden was restored. So man came back into koinonia. Man became a participant and a participator in the realities of God. So John said, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen, and our hands have handled of the word of life. That's what we are inviting you to. And he said, that in his fellowship. And he said, our fellowship is not with ourselves. Our fellowship actually is us and the Father. So man was restored back to communion on account of the cross because God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses against them, but he gave them the word of reconciliation. So he reconciled man back to himself. On the strength of that, man is in the spirit. So Romans chapter 8 verse 9 said, You are in the spirit, not in the flesh. I know you are still thinking evil, but you are in the spirit. Because it is from the spirit that evil can be purged out of you. You can't stand in the flesh and purge evil out of you. So God brought you into an economy of the spirit. So as you mingle with God, over time, evil will be purged out of you. So the first thing the cross achieved for us was to bring us into relationship. And I said, that's the reason when you fall, you don't run to the devil. You run back to God. Because that's the fountain of salvation. But what made it possible for you to be able to run back to God, to receive capacity to live above evil, is because there was a cross standing between you and God. So when God relates with you, He relates with you on the strength of the testimony of the cross. Because on the cross, every anger that God had in His spirit for sin was already enacted on Jesus Christ. So when God checked, you lied, and God... They, you lied and God wanted to judge you because the wages of sin is death. So when you lied, God would have judged you. But when you showed up, God wanted to judge. But every judgment allocated for lie is already on Jesus. So you fornicated. You fornicated. And then you came back to God. And God would have killed you because the wages of fornication is not forgiveness. Spirits don't know how to forgive. If you sin against a spirit, even if you beg him, he won't forgive you. Because forgiveness is not a component of spirits. Spirits are creatures of judgment. The way spirits are designed is to judge. 
So every time you offend the spirit, the only thing he has for you is to judge you. That's why even Jesus, who is part of the, of the Trinity, Jesus, who is the Son of God, when sin came on Jesus, God the Father did not say, Kai, you were with me before the foundations of the world. You know, he said, he was in the beginning with God. But when sin came on him, that relationship could not salvage the effect of judgment. Even though he was with the Father from the beginning, God still killed him. Because spirits can't forgive. Spirits only judge. So what the cross did for you and I is that when God wants to judge you, that judgment was already calculated and put on Jesus Christ. Because where he judged Jesus from was in the spirit, not in time. You are here now. As I'm preaching now, God knows if I will sin tomorrow. So it's not just yesterday God is dealing with. God is dealing with all my lifetime. Because when he judged Jesus, he judged Jesus from eternity past into eternity future. So the price of the cross covers the whole of eternity. The question now is, does this make you sin? No. Unless you are not aware. Because the moment you are aware, you become aware of the consciousness of God. That's why Paul said, the love of Christ constrains us. Because we just judge that if one died for us, then all that live should not live for themselves, but to live for him that died for us. So the moment you know this, you don't shout and say, now I can sin. The moment you know this, that love begins to constrain you. Because you will become reasonable. So what makes you reasonable is not the fear of hell. What makes you reasonable is the awareness of the fact that somebody took the judgment that you could do nothing about. And the moment you knew it, your life becomes a sacrifice. That was what Paul taught. Because you are with God. When you go to talk with your friends, you are now aware that you are with God. When you are taking your bath in the bathroom, you are aware that God is there. You no longer enter the spirit and come out. So he said, you are not in the flesh, you are in the spirit. So that time you are talking to that lady, you are with God. That time you are in the bathroom, you are with God. That time you are in the market, you are with God. Because you have been perpetually sentenced into relationship. So what it does for you is that it quickens an awareness, an awareness of the love of God, an awareness of the presence of God. Threatening people with hair, don't make them stop sinning. In Romans chapter 1, verse 24 and verse 32, the Bible said something. It said, because they do not want to retain God in their knowledge, he gave them a way to a reprobate mind where everything goes. And he listed everything about flesh. And in verse 32, he said, these ones know that the judgment of God is on them that do these things. Yet, they don't only do it, but they derive pleasure in those that do it. So, fear of Hades does not stop people from sinning. It's the love of God that constrains men. So, beyond relationship, beyond authority, the third thing the cross does is that it activates the possibility of perfection. So, when Jesus came, in Matthew chapter 15 verse 48 and say be a perfect as your heavenly father is perfect what Jesus was telling us is that on account of the cross it's possible to live without sin because perfection is not just maturity perfection is actually a state of incorruptibility because God is not just mature he's ageless if you say be a perfect as your heavenly father is perfect he's not talking about maturity he's also talking about incorruptibility so one of the things the cross does for us is that as we enter into the economy of the love of God, that love begins to rule us. That love begins to constrain us. It's a liquid kind of love. You can't explain it. Help us, help us, help us. If you see a man sinning, he has not understood love. Love is a constraining force against sin. Why do you keep yourself faithful to your wife? Is it because you are afraid your wife will kill you? No. Fidelity is a function of love. The power to preserve is captured in love. It's a dimension in God that keeps the purity and the texture of the soul. So Paul said, we dust judge. We dust judge. The moment a man understands the cross, he comes to a point where he begins to judge himself. If one died for me, the only reasonable thing for me to do is to give my life in exchange for him. And the moment a man begins to live like that, something happens to his soul. His soul is beginning to gain purification. His soul is beginning to gain strength and capacity to stand. It's a life beyond self. There are three things that corrupt men. One is men. Two is the systems of this world. And three is spirits. 
if you meet the wrong man, they will corrupt you. Because men have the capacity to corrupt. If you are in a system that is evil, it will corrupt you. And if you engage demonic spirits, they will corrupt you. These are the three major things that corrupt men. What love does is that love fights. It fights to preserve your soul. There are three things that we share tonight. Three things that make for perfection. And all of them are standing on the cross. One is love. Two is light. And three is life. They are the three triangles of, of, of perfection. Love, light, and life. Love. I'm trying to keep it calm. Love preserves you from the corruption that comes from men. Light preserves you from the corruption that comes from systems of this world. And life preserves you from the corruption that comes from spirits. It's possible for a man to be perfect if he understands the cross. There are men in this world who are perfect. And I mean perfect, not just mature, but they are incorruptible. The Bible said something. It said if it were possible, even the very elect would have been deceived. What it means is that it's not possible. There are certain men that have journeyed on certain corridor that it is impossible for them to be corrupt. It's a dimension that is captured in love. And what love does is that love makes you travel outside of self. Because what the cross reveals to you is that Jesus stepped out of self to die for you. So the only way you can be reasonable to repay and to replenish and to recount for that which is done is that you too must travel out of self. So it becomes a commandment of the spirit. So in John 10, 17 and 18, he said, this commandment have I received of my father. I have the power to lay down my life and to take it up again. It's a dimension that is captured in love. The moment the revelation of the cross downs on a man, the first thing that happens to the man is that he lays down self and he steps out of himself. There are many people here who have never done anything because of God or others. They are still captured within the crucible of self. And if a man is in self, he's a harbinger of sin. Because when self is awoken, the devil has a throne. The, the throne of demonic spirits in time and in space is on flesh. It's a self-centered reality. And the only thing that has the power to destroy it is the liquid love that flows from the understanding of the cross. This is why we teach the cross. It's not a historical reality. It's a dimension, a mystery in God that restores a man back to the original template that God designed. You come to a point where it becomes impossible for corruption to exist within your boundary. I didn't know this. God woke me up and began to teach me. Because the Christianity that was handed down to us is a Christianity that suggests that it was impossible to live above sin. So the reason we were slaves of sin is not because we were weak. It's because we were taught defeat before we began. So we had the consciousness that sin will always be a part of us. The Bible said, be ye renewed in the spirit of your mind. The spirit of your mind is different from your mind. Your mind is the part of the soulish organ that processes things, that retains things. But the spirit of your mind is a, a status quo that your mind attains. Is a, a state that your mind has entered that is like the backdrop from whence you process. You know, there's no way you can see me outside of this backdrop. That's what the spirit of your mind is. So there are certain people that believe men are wicked. So even if you are good to them for five years, they will tell you men are wicked. It only takes time. So they can never see good in a man. That's the spirit of their mind. There are certain people that believe the Igbos are not trustworthy. That's the spirit of their mind. So even if you are with them for 30 years, so long as you are Igbo, they believe you are not trustworthy. But it's not a disposition of the spiritual man. Because there's a place in Christ that if a man enters, he can be washed, he can be transformed. There are certain people that believe the Muslim man is violent. There are certain people that believe if you are from the middle bed, you are lazy. It's a spirit of the man. That's the same tradition that was handed down to us. That it is impossible to be holy in this life. It's impossible to live above sin. So Jesus said, be ye holy. 
be ye perfect rather as your heavenly father is perfect peter said be ye holy as your heavenly father is holy it is possible to live in a realm above corruption it is traceable to the cross the moment the love of christ begins to constrain a man he does something to that man he loses the ability to live for himself and the moment a man loses the ability to live for himself god takes over he steps out of the boundary of self and something about him that was in the original dna that god sculpted begins to find expression it is an operation that is captured in love it's an operation captured in love why do you think god instituted the marriage instituted marriage it's not just for procreation in Romans 8.32, it said, you should be conformed to the image of Christ. So every spiritual system that God creates is to give you an opportunity to attain conformity, including the church, including marriage. You may think you are perfect until you have to live with somebody at close range. That's where you see that the apostle is an angry beast. That's where you see that the prophet is a liar. That's where you see that the evangelists have no control. It is an institution that reveals to you flesh. And the cure to that institution is to learn the way of love. Is to learn. So it tells the man, sacrifice all to the woman. It's a dimension of love that helps the man to step out of self. And it tells the woman, submit to your husband. It is impossible for a woman to submit. It is impossible for a man to be sacrificial. But what that economy tries to achieve is to create a dimension of the Christ so that you become the image of God. I was in Lawrence Oyo's, Oyo's wedding and the man who shared told us that you are, God didn't say get married and be happy. Happiness is not the reason for marriage. You will be happy all the same. But the reason for marriage is to learn the image of Christ. So as he buffets you every day, you learn conformity. Every time the other person offends you, he touches layers of your flesh that is still alive. And when flesh wants to react, then the love of God appears. That that is not the reaction. The reaction is to learn death. The reaction is to learn blocks of... That's why he said, this is the fruit of the Spirit. He said, the fruit of the Spirit is... He didn't say, ah, the fruit of the Spirit is love. But he began to show you the tributaries of love. He said, patience, long-suffering, kindness, faithfulness. All of this dimension exists when you deal with men. So the man can be callous. The man can be wicked. While you are praying for the man to be chained, he's giving you an opportunity to learn the love of God. And the love of God is to step out of flesh so that you can express the nature of Christ. This is what the cross teaches us. That we thus judge. That if one died for us, then we that live no longer live for ourselves. Everything about our life becomes for God and for others. It's a way of the spirit and it's the journey into perfection. Many never get there you can be a christian for 50 years but you will never know love and if you don't know love you can't be perfect you can't be perfect that's why even faith galatians 5 6 faith walk it by love it's a nature that is in god and it's only on the basis of the cross that that can be taught because the cross teaches you to become reasonable and when you become reasonable you know the way of the spirit is the way of love The mysteries of the cross is the mystery of perfection and one of the first area of perfection is perfection with men you have won the battle with men they can't get you no matter what they do even when they tamed jesus while he was on the cross breathing his last he said father forgive them they know not what they do you can't break him he has become an embodiment of love and you can't break love it flows, it flows, it flows. So every man that understands the cross, the love of God constrains him. He is bent by the love. There are many things he can do, but that love becomes a law over his soul. There are times when the best thing to do is to slap the person, but it's in the flesh. There are times when the best thing to do is to deny the person certain access, but it's in the flesh. So when you shake, you have no choice. This commandment have I learned of my father. I have the power to lay down my life. It's a power that is not available to natural men. 
is only available to men that live in the spirit. The ability to lay down your life. I know my rights. I can defend it. But love wouldn't let me. And so many times we cry. It's because we know what to do. He said, do you not know that I can ask my father and he will send 12 legions of angels. Who are these? He said, whom seek ye? Jesus of Nazareth. I am he. They went back and fell. Whom seek ye? Jesus of Nazareth. I told you already, I am he. They went back and fell. But love came. Love came and he handed over himself. This is the way of victory. You can't attain perfection until you know the testimony of love. And that's one thing the cross comes to teach us. That's why it said there is no greater love than this. That the man give his life for his friend. Nothing works unless love takes over. Nothing prevails unless love takes over. And it is the cross that teaches us the love of God. How do you enter into the love of God? Because light has a way of entering. Love has a way of entering. And life has a way of entering. How do you enter into love? It's by communion. Because only the Holy Ghost has the capacity to shed this love abroad in your heart. In Romans 5.5, 5, it said the love of God is shed. It's like a river. It's liquid. So as you stay with the Holy Ghost, what it does is that he opens chambers of your soul. And it permeates your soul with that love. So the love travels until it becomes a river that swallows you up. It's a dimension of the spirit. Many don't commune enough. That's why they are callous. Many don't commune and love. That's why they know not love. And in 1 Corinthians 16, 22, it says, if you love not the love Christ, you are anathema maranatha. If you don't know love, you are already an accursed person waiting for the coming of the Lord. That's the meaning of anathema maranatha. So perfection is the way of love. And if you violate the way of love, you are already accursed. That's the standard of God. But it's shed abroad. How many have communed enough to enter into the gates of love? I know you seek power. But there's a power that is beyond manifestation. There's a power that makes you become like unto the Christ. It's the power of love. Many never get there. Many never get there in a lifetime. And if you don't know love, you will be corrupt. No matter how you try. Many times the things that push you will be your ambition. Many times the things that push you will be your own welfare. Self will become your operating system. They prove that you have no love is that self will be crucified. And that's what the cross came to do. Is to teach you the way of love. You want to know whether you are growing in God. Don't check the manifestation in your life. Check the texture of your love. And the way to check how much love is in your spirit is in your relationship with man. When a man truly loves, he wins the battle and the warfare of relationship. Many never get there. In 1 Corinthians 13, Paul began to speak from verse 1 to 13. It was a, a, a profiling of love. I can speak in the tongues of angels. It's possible to know all mysteries. And when the man speaks, you are like, wow, was he born in heaven? I can give my body to be burned. He said, but if I have not love, I am like a clanging simba. Every other thing is a waste except we enter into the economy of love. That's what defines the quality of our lives. A man without love is not alive. He's already there to pleasure he is just not aware. Our obsession most times is about power. Our obsession most times is about mysteries. Our obsession most times is about manifestation. I told you the subject of the cross deals with the foundation of Christianity. The basics and love is one of them. He said these three things abide. Faith, hope and love. And of them all, he said love is the greatest. Because love brings out the purity of the nature of God in your life. 
I know you say you are holy. You left the mountain after 40 days fast and you are walking like a spiritual man. We will check the impact of that fast when the first offense comes. They looked at Jesus and they were amazed. How come this man can never be offended? And Peter came to him and said, Okay, how many times should my brother offend me in a day? And Jesus said, 70 times, 7 times. He said, 7 times. He said, 7 times. He said, No, I actually meant 70 times, 7 times. How many is that? 490 times. That's one brother. What if you have 10? Because the river of love is endless. When it begins to flow, it's no longer about the offense. It's about who you have become. Who you have become. It's like an antivirus. No matter the virus, it's not about how many viruses are there. It's an antivirus. Viruses don't stick there. That's what it's about. And when a man has known love, the man has come into perfection. He has come into perfection. Nothing can get him anymore. And the devil knows men that love. Trusting God for the healing anointing. And the Lord asked me, why do you think I heal the sick? And that was when I realized I knew many scriptures, but I didn't know some truths. You know, it's one thing to know scriptures scattered here and there. But you may not know truth. Because <laughs> truth is not just knowledge, it's understanding. It's when knowledge is coordinated. He said, why do I heal the sick? And I went back, checked began to check my spirit and I discovered there was a challenge and the next question is why do you want to heal the sick <laughs> that was when I knew that my prayer revealed the corruption in my soul you know when you come before a deity don't talk plenty you may talk and your, your talk will land you in trouble if you can don't even think wait for him to give you the thought you know Ezekiel showed up he said Mortal man, can these bones live? The man was wise. He said, Thou knowest. Come before his spirit. Lord, give us power. Let's check our word. Why do you need power? He asked me two questions. Why do I heal the sick? Why do you want to heal the sick? And then I realized I didn't know anything about the sick. I went back to scripture. And I checked almost every time Jesus healed the sick. He said, and he was moved with compassion. He was moved. And the moment I discovered it, he said, do you have compassion for the people you are going to pray for? And the last time I checked, for me, it was a display of power. Compassion was not part of the equation. So I went back and my prayer stopped from give me power to heal the sick. My prayer became, Lord, help my heart. The antidote of corruption is the love of God. You can't win among men until you have known love. Else, the more influence you have, the more corrupt you become. There are many pastors that were good until they began to have influence. Many pastors were good until they began to have money. They thought what was stopping their ministry was lack of influence. So they gave money, did all the publicity. And the moment they started becoming popular, they became princes of darkness. Because they don't know the things that are spiritual checkers for accuracy in the spirit. If you come before a spirit, the things you look for are not the things you think. It's only among men that certain things count, not before spirits. If you meet a spirit, you'll be amazed. The things you will look for. That's why many came to him. They said, Lord, Lord, we did many mighty things in your name. They said, away from me, you workers of iniquity. They never realized that there was iniquity within their chambers. Ambition motivated them. Fame motivated them. Power motivated them, not love. The victory over the war among men is predicated upon the texture of the love of God in your heart. And the love of God is shared abroad in our hearts by the Spirit. Happy is the man that have known the way of love. You know, somebody should be repenting in his heart already. Because the last time you checked, it's difficult for you to tell whether you love. 
it has always been about self. Self-preservation, self-exhortation, self-glorification, self-aggrandizement. These are the four pillars of existence for the man of the flesh. The love of God. When was the last time you did something because of God or others? You discover that that data doesn't exist in your profile. Everything is always about gain. And they institutionalize it. It's your right. You should be wise. Say the wisdom of this world is first of all sensual. It's not from above. But the wisdom from above is pure. There are many things I learned on the corridor of love. I learned it on the corridor of love. Because most of the things I asked God for, I asked amiss. Because I didn't know the way of love. And God will just ask me, why? And the moment the why question comes, it reveals my heart. And then I begin to repent again. So I stopped asking. Because it looks like everything I asked God was for the wrong reasons. I now knew I needed to go back to the school of love. And happy is a man that is taught truth in time. Never learn truth in eternity because it may be too late. Some people regretted not accepting Jesus in Hades. Second gate of perfection, which is predicated on the cross, is the gate of life. told you, the key for the liquid love of God is communion. The reason we spend time in God's presence most of the time is not to beat 10 hours of tongues. It's to commune. It's to come into Him so that He will flow into us. It may not even be about a meeting. It's always about becoming. He said, as many as believe, to them He gave power not for manifestation, first to become the sons of God. It's a dimension in God. The gate of life. Second thing that makes for perfection in time is access to life. Why love gives you victory among men, life gives you victory among spirits a man who does not know and maximize life will lose among spirits because it's always a transaction of life and death when it has to do with the spirit it's always a transaction of life and death the devil cometh not but for to kill to steal and to destroy but I am come that you might have life and life to the full. So what saves and keeps a man from the corruption that comes from spirit is life. If a man is saturated with life, if you like, plant death in him, death will be swallowed up in victory. If you put death in life, life will win. If you put life in death, life will still win. Because the economy is designed such that life is superior to death. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, the Bible began to explain a few things to us. Let me read it. I'm trying to be calm and pass the point across. You know, sometimes you don't hear a lot until you hear the message again. I'm telling you, this is one of them. You will hear again. And you say, did he say this thing? All right, 2 Corinthians 13 verse 4. It said, for, through, for though he was crucified through weakness, yet 
he liveth by the power of God. For we also are weak in him, but we shall live with him by the power of God. There is something the crucifixion does. It brings you into a place of vulnerability. So you submit to the will of God. But the moment crucifixion is attained, what erupts is life. That's why life proceeds from death. He is the first from the dead. The first begotten from the dead. There is a dimension of life that comes from death. What the crucifixion does is to bring you to your end, your wit's end. You come to that point where you surrender all things because you no longer believe or count in anything. Then God begins to show you his sufficiency. So in the crucifixion, God attempts to bring his life through a channel of death. That act alone reveals the victory of life over death because the life waited for the substance to die so that life can proceed. That's why Jesus said, except a corn of wheat falls to the ground and die. It's a mystery of the cross that there is a life that can power you, but that life will never come until you are crucified. If you don't accept the verdict of that crucifixion, you will keep attempting in yourself. That's what God taught Abraham, the patriarch of faith. He said, get thee out of thy country. Get thee out of thy kindred. Get thee out of thy father's house. The guy was a prince. His father, Terah, was the son of Nahor. Nahor was one of the princes of Nimrod. And Nimrod is the pioneer of the tower of Babel in the land of Shinar. The heritage the guy has is not what you will want to leave for anything. But when the verdict of the cross comes, it challenges what your confidence anchors on. And the moment you give it up, there is something about the elements of life that is provoked in your spirit. You can never have victory over death except you accept the verdict of the cross. If a man is taught what the cross is and he sees the example of Christ, remember, Jesus was limited to Nazareth. He was released, re limited to the land of Judea. So Jesus trekked from one place to another. Jesus preached from morning to night until he was thirsty, until he was hungry, until he was weak and vulnerable. At some point, he wept. Until he died. And when he rose, he entered the room and him by himself, he said, all hail the king. He was not waiting for anybody to hail him. He said, all hail the king. Because I have journeyed to death and back. And any man who comes back from death can't die anymore. That's what the cross teaches. As you accept this truth, something happens. You know, the devil knows that it's natural for man to die. But there is an economy in God. When you hide in the cross, something happens to you. So the same thing that swallows up your generation, it comes to you and it falls down. They said this thing eats people up. Well, you didn't know, you didn't do anything. Even you yourself know. You know you didn't do anything. Like our brother that they shot and the bullet didn't enter. He knows he didn't do anything. If he comes down and say, yes, um, when they wanted to shoot me, I entered the spirit realm. It's a lie. <laughs> he didn't enter any spirit realm. <laughs> you know, there are people that want to showcase flesh. The guy didn't do anything. They shot and God saved him. And he comes later. I said, you know, because of some of these things that I was doing, uh, the Lord told me. The Lord told you nothing. <laughs> but the thing is, you had entered into life. And life knows how to stir up itself when it sees death. That's the design. The moment death shows up, life begins to stir. Stir. It rises on your inside like a lion. If a man has tasted of life, he's joining the path of perfection. Because there is no way death can defeat life. And that life is availed to us only by the cross. Because before Jesus died, the Holy Ghost was in him. The power of God was in him. The life of God, everything was in him. There was no way you could have him. But while he was on the cross, he was punctured. And God diffused out of him. 
and that God that diffused out of him, anybody that accepts him enters into the same economy. So the life that was locked in Christ, the life began to flow into everybody. So the same life Jesus has is the same life that we have. So the same victory that Jesus enjoyed is the same victory that we enjoy. That's why he said, even if you drink any deadly thing, it's not saying use any rema. It's telling you if this life is in you, you have the power to lay it down and to take it up. Even if you drink any deadly thing, it's not saying pray in tongues. You may not even know, but you know you have life. And if that life is paired, they can give you poison to drink. You will drink it and they will come and check. Because you are supposed to die after 24 hours. And on the third day, you came out of your room and they are like, Morning, sir. Are you here? Yes, I'm here. I'm not going. I'm here. I'm here. They put something on your chair in the office. You just came. Thank you, Holy Spirit, because I am the victory that overcomes the world. And you sit down and they are watching. They are waiting for you to shout and die. There's life. There's life. Paul! Paul was traveling. He entered the city after the shipwreck. And he, they were packing for a wood and he carried a snake. A snake hinged on his hand. And they say, oh, this is a wicked man. He, he, he escaped the wreck, but his fate has caught up with him. And Paul threw the, the snake into fire. And he was doing his thing. And the people were looking. It was soon for me to, it will soon die. Hey, what do we do? After some time, when he didn't die, they say, you are a god. <laughs> you are a god. It's the technology of life. The guy didn't pray. The Bible didn't say Paul prayed. But Paul had life. He had life. Because life subdues death. So he said, even if you drink any deadly thing, he said nothing. He didn't say some. He said nothing shall by any means hurt you. Because anything that can hurt is in the boundary of death. And you are walking by superior technology. Nothing shall by any means hurt you. It doesn't matter where it was concocted for. They can bring it from your village. Habalists can gather together and plan it. They can put it in front of your door. You will walk on it and say we walk by a different set of rules. We don't die. He said he that believeth in him that sent me. He that believeth. John 5.24 He has passed from death to life. He didn't say he will. He said he has passed. I have passed from death to life. If the devil comes now, he came late. Because I have passed. I'm not passing. I'm not trying to pass. I have passed from death to life. It's the verdict of the cross. This is the assurance that we have. Christians are running up and down. Trying to be saved. What? Who? Trying to be what? You don't know who you are. But we don't meditate on the cross. When you meditate on the cross, something happens to you. You discover. You discover. How do you maximize life? You maximize love by communion. You maximize life by eating the word of God. My son, attend to my word. Give thine ears to my saying. Let them not depart from the midst of thy heart. They are life to them that find them. They are life. In John 6, 63, he said, The words I speak unto you, they are not vocabularies. They are spirits. They are life. A man who eats the word, what he's doing is that he's bubbling. And a point comes where life overwhelms him. That's why he said, lay hands on the sick, they will recover. He didn't say pray for the sick, touch them. If you touch them, they recover. Because you flow, life flows from you. So you are not receiving eternal life from heaven and giving people. You become a fountain of life. So when you do begin to talk to people, you are communicating life. That's why people hear you and after a while, they are changed. They don't know why. Somebody was listening to me from Germany. Stage 3 cancer. Already they had predicted when he would die. But he heard, he heard, he heard. And after two weeks, he went back and they checked. There was no iota of cancer in his body. Because I'm not speaking English language. I am speaking spirit and life. Why do you say, he says, say to this mountain. You don't talk to mountains, you create them. But there's an economy of life. That when you speak to a mountain, the mountain moves. It moves. It's possible because of the cross. Not by power. Not by might. But by the spirit. These are truths in the spirit. We are not trying to be nice. We are not trying to be optimistic. These words are yea and in Christ Jesus. Amen.
man walked in this dimension until they tried to kill him, they couldn't. They said they put him in boiling oil. He couldn't die. He was not praying. They dragged him on the street. Not one of his body was injured. This is not story. It's reality. But how much do you engage the world? How much? If you engage the world enough, it begins to permeate your body. Because it's a truth. And truth is real, both in the spirit and in the natural. And when they couldn't kill him, they cast him to the Isle of Patmos for him to die there. But he journeyed through the world until he appeared in heaven. And when you go to heaven, time doesn't count. You can be there for four years, it's like five seconds. And he said, I was in the spirit on the last day. I was in the spirit on the last day. They thought they would kill me. They don't know. You have to invent again. It's only God that can kill us. Moses entered this economy so deep that God knew that Moses will not die. Because at 120, the Bible said his strength was intact and his eyes were not abated. So when Moses offended God, God said, go to the mountain of Nebo and die there. I will kill you. Because only God knows how to kill a man with life. The technology is not in the demonic. Until God said, come home, you can't die. And then you are there. They say, hey, pray. you have to give this offering for long life. You have to do this for a long... Nonsense. Nonsense. If that's where you're... Fa- I tell you something. See, truth is in levels. There are certain truths that are for babes, but them that are mature, they talk mysteries. So if you need to wash your feet to live for long, that's where what your faith will be released on. Do it. If you need to give a seed to live long, that's where your faith operates. But some of us, we know that by the exchange of the cross, we have come into life. And that life rules us. We don't die. Did you not read about the patriarchs? When they were come of age, he said they gathered their children, they blessed them, and they rested with their fathers. They don't die. When they are tired of it, they say, come, gather around me, oh yes, sons of Israel. I will tell you what will happen to you. I would have stayed with you, but I'm tired. So Reuben, so Judah, so Levi, he narrated their destinies. And when he finished, he told them to leave, and he laid on his bed and slept. You think when they say slept, they are joking. They are tired. They just checked out to the other side. That's Christianity. This is not a hype. This is truth. I told you yesterday that there's a generation coming that will not die. That's the generation of the rapture. They will eat the word of God so much. They will know the truth in the word of God until a point we come. If a, that's what Paul said. He said we will be clothed with our heavenly tabernacle. When they want to leave, they are changed into another man. They wear their heavenly garment and they climb into heaven. Elijah said he was going to a point after Jordan. When he got there, he told Elisha, what do you want? I'm about to be carried. That's a man that walked this earth. I am about to be carried. And when Elisha said, I, I need a double portion, he said, what you ask is, is difficult. But if you see me as I'm taking, what are you saying? That man knows he can't die. If you see me as I'm taking, and he walked through four cities, he left Bethel, he went to Jericho, he left Jericho, he went to Ai, he left Ai, he crossed Jordan. And when he came, this is the hour. If you see me, and while he was yet talking, he said chariots of fire came from heaven and he was escorted with a whirlwind. How do you kill such a man? That's what the cross did. He gave you a life that death cannot impregnate. He gave you a life that rules over death. This is what makes for perfection. So if that life is in you, anything they throw at you is a waste. It's not just about your physical body. Every manipulation of the devil, when it comes, the life will choke it. It will choke it. So you came online to preach, you saw a naked person, the life will choke it. You will see a harlot, others are falling, the life will choke it. When things are corrupt men, when they come, the life will choke it. It will choke it. And the devil will realize that, Kai, if I continue with this man, I will waste my resources. So the devil stop attacking you. That's what the Bible said concerning Samuel. In 1 Samuel 7 verse 12 to 13, it says Samuel planted a stone and called it Ebenezer. And he said from that day, the Philistines withdrew and they never attacked Israel again. And the hand of God was perpetually against the Philistines. They withdrew because when the devil tries and he fails many times, he will withdraw. 
He said the devil left him for a season because life is at work. And even when Jesus entered hell, entered Hades, that life brought him back. That's the transaction of the cross. That God brings you the resurrection life. Because if you don't go through the cross, you can't resurrect. We are resurrected beings. We are resurrected beings. That's who you are. We are resurrected beings. Because we don't live the life of the Jesus before the cross. It's the life of the Jesus after the cross that we live. We are resurrected beings. Resurrected men don't die. The truth of the gospel. Sit down. Can I tell you something? If we were told that we could live above sin, those who are addicted today will be less. Those confessing forgiveness today will be less. We were not told. That's why we struggle with sin. If we were told that we could not die, you will be shocked that very few will be sick. The reason we struggle is because the spirit of our mind was corrupt by wrong doctrine. But a generation is coming that we walk with this truth. This message I'm preaching will be more relevant in 50 years. Because then the body of Christ will mature. And there will be many who come for sick. What do you think happens when a man of God prays for somebody with a contagious disease? The guy has to back losses. You are going to pray for him. Don't you know if he coughs, he will cut it. The guy has Ebola. You are going to pray for him. He has COVID-19. You are going to pray for him. What do you know? You know you have life. That was why Jesus touched those who were leprous. He touched them because he knows that this one doesn't work. It's not a John G. Lake dimension. It's a reality for the body of Christ. You can carry the virus, nothing will happen. You were not taught. And because you were not taught, you can't release your faith. Because your faith is a proponent of your understanding. The moment you can understand, you can believe. We were not taught. That's why every Christian takes cover. And they say COVID and people come to church. They can't shake people anymore. Because we live in fear. We live by the prescriptions of the doctor. So even when the, the believer is sick. And you are praying for the believer. It's a religious thing. His confidence is on the drugs they gave him. He will take them religiously. Give him scripture. He will not recite them. Because that's his reality. We were not taught. Many religious activities. People talking rema. But they don't know truth. They don't know truth. That's why we struggle and grapple in darkness. Because we're not taught. And if God shows you this truth, begin to engage it. Because you intensify life by eating the word. He said, I found thy word. I eat them. I did eat them. And they became the joy and the rejoicing of my heart. He said in Isaiah 8.20 To the law and to the prophets if they speak not according to this word there's no truth in them. There's no light in them. Oh, you speak, Christians say, be careful. Wisdom is profitable to direct. But what they call wisdom is fear. And so when the Christian is at the wit end of his life, he's hopeless. He's hopeless. You came to the hospital, you think he believes what you are saying. It's because the doctor told him you'll be fine. Meanwhile, he doesn't know the doctor is trained to encourage you. So even while the doctor is telling him, don't worry, it's a small, it's a minor thing. The doctor knows that it's terribly bad. You are in ICU, they are saying, it's alright, don't worry, you'll be fine. And he believes the doctor. He believes the doctor. John Austin's wife was told she had eight days to leave. And then she gathered 40 scriptures. And began to meditate on the scriptures. Morning, afternoon, night. Morning, afternoon, night. Eight days became 40 days. 40 days became two years. Two years became ten years. Because the word of God is truth. Sanctify them with thy word. Thy word is truth. When it comes, it purifies. It's a gate to perfection. You can have absolute victory. It's not a story. The part of the justice has a shiny light. It shines brighter and brighter unto the perfect day. But how many know and how many can believe? You enter into life by your understanding of the word. The more you eat, the more you become. I eat it every day. And the more I say it, the more it becomes real to me. And I don't owe anybody any apology to say it. I will say it until one day my body will glow with light. It will happen. You 
it's not a John G. Lake dimension. It's a reality in the cross. And everybody can walk it. I told you yesterday, if they said they shot somebody, you hear the story of Archbishop Bessie Daosa. Thank God for his life. He opened us to possibilities in Christ. But it's not his reality. It's in Christ. They shot him. Nothing happened. You say, hey, Lord, give me the mantle of Bessie Daosa. Now they have shot a member of your choir and he didn't die. Go and collect his mantle. Religion. We can't teach men truth so they stand on it. So you bring story to stir people's emotion and they never become. What builds men is truth. If Ben in the could do it, you can do it. Because he didn't do it because he was Ben in the He did it because he had faith in the finished works of Christ. And if you have that faith, you have the same experience. We honor him because he helped us to believe in it. But it doesn't end with it. With him. Elijah heard the story of Enoch and he said, me too, I will not die. And he didn't die. Because it's not an Enoch reality. It's a dimension in God. Love gives you victory among men. Life gives you victory among spirits. Then the third is light. Light gives you victory in the systems of this world. He said in John 1.5, the light shines in the darkness. The darkness comprehended it not. The systems can be there. The status quo can be there. But you can walk there and not be corrupt. That's why he said in John 9.5, so long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. But he said, you, you, are the light of the world. A city set upon a hill that cannot be hid. It's a dimension in Christ. The moment a man enters into light, something happens to him. He can no longer be corrupt. You can be in the police. They are taking bribe. You will not. Nothing happens to you. You have entered light. They may send you to a village to suffer. When you enter that village, you will activate development. Because you are not just an officer. You are an apostle to the police force. You can be in a business. They say, no, if you don't do it like this, it will not work. But you have light. You have light. So you can't be compromised. It's a dimension in Christ. How do you enter? He said, if you walk in the light, as he is in the light, the blood of Jesus cleanses you from all sin. When a man begins to walk in light, he has entered into the gate of perfection. He has entered into perfection. How do you maximize light? It's by beholding. You maximize love. Listen. You maximize love by communing. You maximize life by eating the world. But you maximize light by beholding. For we all with unveiled faces. Beholding as in a glass, the image of the Lord, we are changed. So a man enters into conformity. Because light has come. Light takes him far above the systems of this world.